please welcome to Vlad TV, Emmy Award winner, Miss Jack A. Harry. Jack A., you, you, you're born in, in what, North or South Carolina? Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Oh, did, so, so I, I know you have roots in New York. How'd you make it from um, Winston-Salem up to New York? Well, my mother had to leave me because she couldn't afford a babysitter, so she took my siblings, my sister and brothers, up north, and I stayed uh, until I was about nine. And then she came and got me. And um, when I got to New York, uh, I loved it. I mean, I loved school. So I was basically raised by teachers, to be honest with you, in terms of my uh, background. So um, I was a little, what's the word, country. And then I became uh, a New Yorker overnight. So it had to do with where my mother took me. But my teachers, you know, my teachers in New York really formed me. I became a whole nother person. When you say you were raised by teachers, uh, were any of your parents in education? No, they took me everywhere. I was very, I hate to say that, I was very smart. So mm -hmm. um, I got skipped twice. So I was, you know, I was a little head. You know, this is what happens to kids sometimes when, you know, I talk too much in class, but I was finished by noon, you know? So you get, I didn't get in trouble, but they took me everywhere, museums, on trips. They based my, my mother uh, let my aunt have me a couple of years. So they fully formed me because I like to learn. I like to suck up knowledge. So uh, I, I was able to, you know, it was a little fast. I was in a fast lane in terms of my development. You know, it's, it's interesting because the, the whole Jack A persona, I, you know, people wouldn't realize you got skipped twice. And, and you just said, forgive me for saying that. that. That is something that should be applauded. And something I would, you know, being skipped twice is is an amazing accomplishment. I mean, uh, yeah, and academically, but in terms of a child's development, I can see why people don't want to do it. Because you miss out on your childhood. You know, the things that people do. You know, be mm -hmm. hang with your friends, go to the park, after school, cut class. You don't do that. My whole life was academics, which I love. I still do. Mm -hmm, I'm a, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a bookworm. I love uh, learning. I love teaching, which is what I'm about now. I'm, I'm about mentoring. I think I'm Oprah, but I ain't, cause I ain't got, I ain't got no money. But um, I, I enjoy teaching and learning. That's really my, my passion. A lot of people do, don't do, know that. <laughs> no, I mean, um, to this day, are you uh, a Kindle person, or you like your hardcover physical books? physical books. I just got my book today the, her, from her book club, The Covenant of Water, and uh, 700 pages. I'm like, I'm going to be a while. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm into it. Hardcover. The physical got book. You. Yeah. I, got, I have so many books. It's ridiculous. When I pass, they'll see. It's just ridiculous. But I, I love it. It's something um, that enriches me. But that's the academic side. I have a fun side, which is what everybody sees. But yeah, that's that's what the world knows you as is having that fun, sassy side. Mm -hmm, but I got a I got a temper. I'm not letting you see it. <laughs> no. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> OK, where, where'd your love of the arts come from? New York. That's what I'm saying. My teachers, they took me everywhere. I've been around the world. I've been to Paris. I've been taken. I don't know why a lot of kids get this way. You know, you see some little kid in the corner and they just say, come on. Because they know how to hang. I knew how to hang. You know, I still do. Uh, you look like you do, too. But a lot of New Yorkers I know are like that. We're ready to go and mm -hmm. say, what's happening over here? Ooh, this is great. Uh, clubs. I hung out with older musicians. I, you know, I was married three times. Two to musicians. <laughs> uh, ooh. It was fun at, at first. But um, it's just uh, the need to soak up, you know, whatever I'm in, uh, involved in. Which luckily I didn't get involved in anything nefarious, you know. That's why I said, forgive me, because everybody ain't so lucky. Got a lot of smart mm -hmm. people out there. Some people have been skipped more times than me, and they, you know, they're not doing so well. So I try to balance it. I didn't used to. I used to be, uh, you know, a little quiet, little nerdy little kid. And then, 16, it was on. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you discover, you know, 
I, I want to be an actor. This is something I want to pursue full time. I went to, in New York, a place called the Henry Street Settlement. It's down on the, near Delancey Street. You used to have to take mm-hmm. three trains to get down there. The last one was the F train. And then I had to walk, I don't know how many blocks, but I got into a play down there. My girlfriend from uh, Music and Art, which is where I went, High School of Music and Art. And she took me down there and I was like, I don't know, 15. And I got into a play to make $12 per show on the weekend, four shows. And I had one line and um, I liked it. But then I enrolled in acting classes down there with Woody King Jr. And I began to take acting lessons for five solid years. And then I realized that this is what I want to do. It took me that long. Yeah, because I graduated from Long Island University. You know, the Brooklyn Center? Mm -hmm. Over there, I know. Everybody's in Brooklyn now. It wasn't so popular then. Everybody's like, you going to Brooklyn? Now it's like, I live in Brooklyn. You know, everybody's so proud. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they're Fort Greene. You mentioned you graduated from um, Long LIU. Island University. Yeah, and, and you graduated with a degree in what? In education? Uh-huh, yes, American history. I taught, I, I taught at Brooklyn Technical High School, which was down a few blocks from Long Island University. All boys. Um, before I got a soap opera. <laughs> my life. That's what, what, what grade was that? What, what grade would you teach? Ninth and tenth. Nasty little okay. boys. But no, no, no. You say some nasty little boys, but but I, I remember you. I remember when you hit the screen when when I got introduced to you as a child on two two seven, and it was like you had that Lord have mercy. Like it was like Lord have mercy. Who is that woman on the screen? So you talking about you teaching ninth and tenth graders? I know they couldn't focus. Uh uh-uh. uh. They focus because I don't take that mess. I still don't. We are who we are, but I've learned physical doesn't mean anything unless you can back it up. You know? That's right. That's why I try to teach these young young girls out here. But some people can handle it, you know, like Megan the Stallion, I love her. It's like if you can handle that image and all that's going on with it. And back then when I was on two two seven, I can handle it, you know. My, uh, I can, I can back it up. <laughs> that means that you know all that image you're trying to project. You better be able to say this is what I am. Don't fake it. Don't try to fake mm-hmm. it because beauty doesn't sustain, as we all know. No, that's that's right. And you know your character at that time was was very groundbreaking. Um, you know, and we'll get into that. I want to go backwards for a second because you you started out on the stories. You started out on the soap operas, correct? Yes, another world. It's the funk now, but yes, I uh. I was in heaven. It was a, my biggest job at my foray into TV. I loved it. I got $450 per show. Oh, and that was a lot of money back then, 1981. But I had to go to Brooklyn to tape it at the same studios where Bill Cosby was, the Astoria Studios. You know, with a silver mm. cup. It, that was so pop. And that was huge. Back then, he, had, he built it. You know, he took the studio and had it, you know, made new. It was fabulous time. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I did it for two how, how years. How long was you on it? Two years. But then I got 227. So I did both for a while because I thought I'd be fired from 227. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping <laughs> I'd be fired, to be honest with you. I want to live I want to live in New York. I didn't want to go to LA. I thought you Really? Know, no, because I said I'm an actor. I'm I'm dramatic. I'm brilliant. And I, I you know, I was. I was working a lot, everything. I, I had it going on. I had a man, fiance. I had a life. You know, and that's the way New Yorkers feel today. It's like, I don't want to go out to L.A. You know, because if you have it together, of course, now with the advent of the Internet, you can do both. But back mm-hmm. then you were considered below level if you took a sitcom. It's like a sitcom. Mm-hmm. Till I saw that check, I went, mm-hmm. But <laughs> it, it definitely changed my life forever. So you went from making four hundred and fifty dollars in uh an episode on Another World, and I'm assuming you're still auditioning at this time. No, no. I had gotten that job. I was doing a movie with Robin Williams, and I was also doing a play. I'm telling you, I I had a when I say I had a life, I was it. I was in full effect. So I didn't have a desperation about me when I auditioned mm-hmm. for two two seven. I didn't even. Plan to get it. I just did it because my agent said, go do this audition. And then when I got out there to L.A., I still wasn't, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't hungry. 
But I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be competitive. So mm -hmm. when I saw all those 300 women at that audition, I was like, oh, please. <laughs> but that's how you have to be. If you're going to be in this business, you have to say, oh, no, I'm, I'm the shit. <laughs> of course, mm -hmm, I didn't think mm -hmm. that way, but I knew. I said, I know I, I can get this. But I didn't, you know, I didn't put anything behind it. Now, when I look back, I was like, oh, fearless, huh? <laughs> <laughs> How many times do you have to audition for that part? Once. Excuse me? Once. No call yeah. back, nothing. Got it right there. Got it. Well, I actually got it. We did the audition. They took us back to our hotel because they had us all, all the ladies in one hotel. Like, a, ooh, we had so much fun. I knew a lot of the women. And I got back to the room and we had our doors open because everybody wanted to wait for a phone call. I got a phone call and they said, you got it. And I was mortified. I was like, I got to stay here. I was in tears. But when I got back, I didn't tell them. They were like, well, what is it? What is it? I said, oh, no, that was just another call. I never even told them. I got on a plane and went back to New York and they made me come back. Because I, I wanted to turn it down. Can you believe that? Now, that's a first. I never told anybody that because I didn't know the importance of it. I really didn't. I didn't know anything about sitcoms. I knew nothing. There were not that many black actors out in Hollywood at that time, you know, mm -hmm. on television. It was a very select few who were steadily working. So I wasn't, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know anybody. It was totally new. I knew one person on the show and she and I both came out here, Elena Reed, who's now passed. And um, it was a whole new world, you know, from zero to 60. Wow. Mm -hmm. Real quick. Mm -hmm. You. You, when, when, when you did that interview and you said it was something like three, four hundred people in there interviewing at the time, was it any recognizable faces that's going on to do great things? Well, Shirley Ralph was one of them, but she was already out there. She had a contract with Fox, so she was already jamming. And the other ladies, they, um, they're still acting, yeah. And they, uh, really? uh, Anna Maria Horsfish, she got on Amen. Yeah, people got jobs, mm -hmm. yes. But that was a big deal. But I didn't know it, you know. I was just trying to be fly. <laughs> That's all, you know, and I still try to do that. And I try to instruct people to do that. When you show up, show out. Don't mm -hmm. go in half, you know, half ways. I like a strong, I like a strong presentation. I don't like a little weak, you know, you know. It's like when you watch basketball, you don't want no milk toast player. You know, you want somebody that, you want LeBron. Mm -hmm. You know, but of course I was Michael Jordan in my mind. But <laughs> I'm just making an analogy. You, you know, you want to come off really fierce. And that's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to uh, be anything else. But it got me in a lot of trouble. You know, I'm just listening to you speak. And, you know, I've seen you do interviews over the years. And your personality, it, it seems very, very similar to the character Sandra Clark on 227. No. So when you... Not really, now. You don't think so? Not now. Oh, no. I ain't taking no shit now, no. <laughs> but I'm older, so no. But I know what you mean. Yeah, I mean, going in to do that interview, did you feel like, I, I know her. I, I can do this with my eyes closed. This is me. No, no, I worked on the character, no. But I knew just what I wanted to do is what I'm saying. I didn't, I didn't fumble about it. I just went in and bam. He said, her. Brandon Tartikoff, he also passed. He told me, you got the job, kid. I mean... But I've been lucky like that, knock on wood, a lot. And there are a lot of people like that. Not so many, you know, in the business, but I know a lot of people like that. You go in and you go for it and get it. But be careful what you ask for. You know, when prayers are answered, you shed more tears. I'll tell you that. Get a lot of money, but the sacrifice is great. Was great. Mm -hmm. Took my personal life. But I didn't know it. So now if I look back and I would do it, I would have tried to balance it a little bit more. But I could be lying. <laughs> Were you married when you got that part? No, I was engaged. You was engaged? Yes. Yeah. Would you, would you say, you said if you knew now what you knew then, if you knew then what you know now, you know, you'd have made some different decisions. Do you believe that that part or, or your stardom and fame and how you just really shot off the screen at that time – it played some role in the demise of your first marriage? No, no, no. The marriage ain't got I was engaged. I had already been married. I wasn't famous or on TV or any of that when I got married the first time. No. So that mm -hmm. didn't play okay. a role. But 
I got the soap opera when I was married. Okay. And I began to make the money. And I got more than $450. I'm sorry. I got $450 when I started, but I zoomed up quick too. <laughs> so it all changed. It just, it just, I was just working, but I was hot. When you get on a hot streak, you don't look at yourself. You just do it. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a building block. I was just working. But I mm -hmm. wanted to be the best I could be. And I had the energy for it. So it was just plain New Yorker. I think everybody at that time was hustling, you know. Just just keep just keep on keeping on. And um, people on, um, Felicia Rashad was on uh, the Bill Cosby show, and they were in New York City, so they didn't have the Hollywood experience. Hollywood changes you. That's what did it. If I had done TV in New York, I would have had a different life altogether. But, you know, L.A. has the, the glitz and glamour and the distractions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What was it like, you know, because that that show, 227, it, it, it's iconic in our culture. It, it was it was one of them shows that are gonna is gonna live forever. Working alongside people like the great Marla Gibbs, um, Hal Williams, uh seeing little Regina King at that time and what she's going on to become. Did you really absorb the fact that I, I'm in working alongside greats? Or was it just no. y'all coming to do a job? No, I just came to do a job. And that was where I got in trouble because I just came to work. We were cool. I mean, in terms of my, I didn't come in like, oh, I just, I, I wasn't in the world of sitcoms. I didn't respect the medium because I wanted to be, I wanted to be a, a dramatic actor. I wanted to be um, formidable. You know, I wanted to be respected in terms of my acting abilities, you know, which I still have, you know, and I still get mad when I don't get opportunities, not anymore so much. But, you know, when you see other people doing things and getting accolades for stuff you wanted to do. But I just mm -hmm. happened to be funny. <laughs> Who knew? So that took over. So I didn't really respect that. But they taught me a lot. They taught me a whole lot. My timing, comedy, I know it down flat. But um, no. I didn't go, ooh, ah, but I went to parties and saw big famous people. Don't get me wrong. But working every day, no. You can't fear people you work with or like that. You gotta you gotta be on level playing field. And I was quite competitive. I still am. In terms of when I when I'm working, I like people to be on their game. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm work if I'm here, we want I want everybody here. I'm I'm not interested in being up here and y'all down. Uh uh. I want the team to be a championship team, you know? So I'm like, I'm very competitive. You know, I'm listening to you speak and uh, how you thought of sitcoms. Would it, would it be the equivalent of the way people thought of reality TV shows? Because I remember when reality TV started, it, nobody really wanted to be on it. You looked at them like, like that's over there, like, like real... Actors would never be on a reality TV show. And they, and then, they still aren't, except when they need some paper <laughs> or <laughs> they want their family to have something to do, like Sylvester Stallone. I mean, who cares if he's on a reality show? But it's for his wife and kids. You can see so that they can have, I don't want to say something to do, but something that they can work on and they can make their own dough because, you know, they get paid. So it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a, a a twofold thing now. So there's reality TV stars and then there's actors who do it for their family mainly. Or like I said, mm -hmm. when they need to make a little dough because they pay well, but I would never, and I'm telling you never do a reality show. They say never say never, never. Cause uh, you gotta be somebody you're not. It's like, uh, what's that show? The Osbournes, Ozzy Osbourne. Mm -hmm. They were the first and Jessica Simpson, they were the first to do shows. They were, TV stars, actors doing shows, and look what it did to them. Ruined their personal lives. Ruined. So if you do that, be careful. So, But people like Sylvester Stallone, they can control the narrative. They think. But I I, I still look at reality shows as the what you said. I'm sorry. It's like, but um, they're here to stay. And they mm. have their place in um, the entertainment world. They do. Yeah, they're definitely here to stay. Um, I remember when many of the, the early reality shows started, it was you, people wouldn't touch them. 
Um, but now you you got the house. You got so many that have become uber successful. They they have franchises and spinoffs. Right. So, and they're inexpensive you know, to do. That's another reason. You know, th- th- those girls, maybe one or two will get high, like Candy Burroughs. I mean, nobody's going to get her paycheck. Those rest of those girls are not making that money. So it's a different, you know, product. And they film one camera or whatever. It's not as expensive as a sitcom or a full hour a drama or, you know, or a TV movie. So it's cheaper to do. It's less expensive. And it's, you know, mostly non-union. All that stuff comes into play. But but the grit and all of that is going out of it. It's not real to me. It's like setups. But it used to be good when it was raw. You know, when The Real Housewives was raw, it was fun. But now it looks phony. So that's why reality shows now, that's what we call them. They're fake. They're setups. You know, but they do put people in situations. I did one show. A celebrity wife swap. I mm-hmm. hated it. Yeah, I, yeah. I hated it. Oh, girl, the woman I slot swapped with her family. They didn't eat meat. They didn't have no TV. They barely, oh, they didn't believe in any of that. I was like, oh, but the money was phenomenal. <laughs> and Was uh, the money got, comparable uh, to a sitcom? Oh, no. Oh, no. That, Not comparable. No, that's it. Yeah, that, there's money and then there's money. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you know, how how did your world change when when you won that primetime Emmy? Did number one did the check go up? Number two, did all kind of roles and scripts start getting thrown at you because you you're the first African American female to win a primetime Emmy? That that had to be at that time a huge honor. Well, it was for supporting actress, so. That's, I want to clear that up. It's uh, the first one for supporting actress in a comedy. Mm-hmm. Because Isabel Sanford got it as a, a lead, but nobody ever talks about that because I think we were on strike or something when she won it. So she didn't get her flowers while she lived. So I just want to give her her flowers. But it, yeah, the check went up, but the check was going up anyway. It was fabulous. I had a fabulous time. It was the 80s, honey, oh, and the 90s. But I had a ball. Make no mistake about it. I was not unhappy ever. (laughs) (laughs) Ever. Making a lot of money. I don't know who said money. Please. It's much better having money than not. But it um, it changed everything. I got offered roles, yes. I uh, got movies. Yeah. But I just did them. You know. Mm -hmm. And my ego got out of control for about three years. Yes. I wasn't mean or anything, but I... I had an air of uh, superiority, and I knew it, and I fought it, and I still do. But sometimes ego can crawl right up your neck. See, I'm sitting here. I had to take a (laughs) moment to uh, calm down because before you know it, you're thinking, uh, I'm Jack (gasps) Hay. So that was there, but I fight it every day because it doesn't do any good. I don't want to be pleasant, you know. Pleasant, but not taken advantage of, but pleasant, as pleasant as I can be. So I had that in the 80s. I was that girl, (laughs) the it girl. And I also read, matter of fact, I saw an interview with you and you said, Kenya Barris. Uh, You you know, talking about your ego. What? what, Can we go into that story? uh, mm, mm, Oh, see, those were the years he used to deliver my scripts to my door when I was doing 227. Met him years late, of course. You know, he's the Kenya Barris, you know, blackish, fame, oh, just got it going on. And he reminded me, he said, you don't even remember me. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> he said, I used to deliver scripts. I went, oh, my eyes, I think they became big as my head. Just one eye. <laughs> I was mortified. That's ego. And I truly did not. He said, I used to deliver your scripts. But I said, was I unkind? He said, no. But, you know, unkind doesn't just mean somebody does something to you. It means they ignore you. So I didn't see him. I felt awful about that. So I said, I still got to check myself to this day. You know, it's, it's, it's awful. And I've seen him since then. He just looks at me, but he doesn't lord it over me. But he ain't going to give me no job. Let's just say that. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting to say that. You, you ain't got no scripts with your, with your name on it in, in, in recent years from Kenya, have you? Uh-uh. Not even a K. Uh-uh. Nothing. 
So I got to let that go. But I apologize to him. And he's been very gracious. Uh, so hopefully I will. Hopefully I'll get mm. to work with him, you know. You know, before I move this interview on, do you and the cast of 227 still keep in contact or have a chance to get together once in a while and just talk? Me and Regina are like this. You know, I mean, she's had her... her, her yep. Uh, heartbreaking things. Um, so I won't talk about that. That's her, her, that's her choice to talk about. But I love her to the moon and back in a, back again. I adore her. And not just for her accolades, but for the fact that she remains who she is throughout. And she's had great success. By great success, I mean she understands just where she fits into, you know, the zeitgeist, for lack of a better word, of directing, writing, acting. She's come full circle in terms of being an, an actress. And look at the sacrifice. See, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You, yeah. you can't modulate it. You can, can't control it. The best you can do is just keep living and learn from it. Or, you know, I can't even explain. The words can't express how I feel about her. And uh, Marla plays my mother on the soap opera I do, Days of Our Lives. Yep. Yep. So, you know, she called me up anytime she feel like at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock. She on me. Hey, hey, what's this? What's this? What? What is that? I was like, Marla, please get somebody <laughs> else to tell you. <laughs> Ooh, what does NFSW mean? Oh, <laughs> what does WYD mean? You know, all the stuff that um I learned just naturally. And uh, like I said, Elena said, Hal Williams lives. He's in retirement land and I can talk to him anytime. So I can talk to Anybody. Yeah. So, but you know, in show business, the, the thing about it is you meet people, you work with them and you like them, but you don't see them anymore. You, you know, very rarely do they become friends. So mm. I won't lie to you, but Regina is the one I'm closest with. We hang and it's cool because I like people to be who, who they are. I don't like inauthentic people. I, and I hate it when you're one way with me, like I'm talking to you now and then I become somebody else, you know, when I'm in front of different kind of people. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned Regina and Regina for our generation. She's she's such an incredible actress. And person. We, yep. And person. Yeah. We have watched this woman do so many of the, the you know, the movies that we all know and love. And she's and not finished. Her. You know the she's exactly. Not she's she's just getting started. Yes. Um, but she went through so much in her personal life, and like you said, that that's for her to speak about. But yes. you know, she's had it rough, but she still carries herself with such grace and dignity. I love you know? it. Oh, she got me started. Um, like the what you'll talk about later. But she and the twins got me started on Twitter back in nineteen ninety whatever it was, because and they were. Just on the phone, on the phone, on the phone. I was like, what are you doing? So we're on Twitter. I said, why? <laughs> it keeps you current and relevant. And I was like, who cares? <laughs> but they got me on Twitter. Regina got me on a show. Well, we went on a show together. Watch what happens with Andy Cohen. And when we were in the building, we got into the building, what, 8 o'clock when we did the interview. By the time we left that interview and went back to the limousine, I had 300,000 followers. That's when I got it. Are you serious? That, I'm serious. That's when I got it. That's when I knew the value of the internet and social media. I got a person right then and there to handle it. Because people are like, I'm doing it myself. I said, there's no way I have time for that. I knew then. So I got it on Twitter and, of course, Facebook, uh, Instagram. And to this day, I have the same person. It really, I saw the difference. That's when I got it. From the show, I'm talking about steps to the car. Because we went on the show. Look it up. You watch mm -hmm. it. You'll see why. It wasn't my best day. <laughs> it was. <laughs> we started. What, what he's doing on that show now, Regina and I started. Uh, woo, I was a mess. what they say? A hot mess? I was a, a hot, hot mess. mess. I was a hot mess. <laughs> well, what's your platform of choice? Is, is Twitter your platform of choice? No, say Instagram is the... I think that Twitter has got weakened because uh, you don't know what the truth is. Or, you know, I don't believe nothing I read on the Internet. You just have to check it out and check it out and check it out. But Twitter has become less of what it was. Instagram mm -hmm. is still 
you know, I don't believe in TikTok because of what's happening with young people. I mean, it's very entertaining, but I'm no, I'm I'm way ahead of you, Prince. I'm into you know, AI. I'm into Chat GBT. I'm I'm trying to tell you. I was say <laughs> I tried to tell you. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, Absolutely. that's a whole discussion for and, another and, and day. And I'm scared. I'm scared to death of it all. Like it, when, when it comes to this AI, don't be. You get on it. It's inspiring. You've like been you on Chat been, GPT? Yeah. But it takes some doing to get on there. And then when you get on there, you have to be careful. But it's inspiring. It makes you think you're the smartest person in the galaxy. Because it will enlighten you. And if you're right, say you're writing 10 words and you go, okay, I got an idea for a play or a movie. And you write it down, you feed it into this thing. It starts producing stuff. And you go, oh, yeah, let me explore that. It makes you reach. It's it's good and bad, but the good I think outweighs the bad. Whoever's what do they call it? The human staffers, they call them. The people that feed the info into the the app. That's it. But I mean, try it. No, I recommend it. I'm sorry. I'm one of those. I know what people are saying. It could be dangerous, but it's far more inspiring. This young man sitting up here, he need to get on sitting right there. He need to get into it right now. This is the future. The thirty uh, thirty to thirty five year olds. They should be controlling the AI, to me. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it, that, that's one thing that's going to have to wait because <laughs> I'm scared to death of AI. I oh, truly am. Somebody going to get you a, one night. You're going to be somewhere in a club. Somewhere, you're going to go somewhere and they're going to put you in and you're going to go, she was right. I'm telling you. Especially for what you're doing. It only helps. It really does. But you'll see. It ain't a Darth Vader. It ain't the dark side. You won't go to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm so impressed sitting down talking to you because you you really do have your finger on the pulse of everything. In this conversation, you done mentioned Megan Thee Stallion, um, AI. Like, there, there's almost no topic that we have touched on that you're like, oh, I don't know about that. Or I haven't heard of this person. Do you make a conscious effort to stay this tapped in? Yes, with the young people I work with, and it's a conscious effort. It's not unconscious, but uh, there, I definitely choose with whom I, you know, mingle with and go out with and talk with, as I'm sure you do, even though you don't mm -hmm. think about it. You probably know a lot of people, but there are just a few people you absolutely, you know, talk to and get to understand. And in my case, I've gotten lucky enough for these younger people, they won't let me stay home. They take me, it, I tell you, went to the opera last night to see Othello uh, on a Thursday night. Um, and I've been to the opera, you know, many times I said, but to see a black man do it, which is very rare, you know, sounds so, cause it is about a more, a black man, you know, mm -hmm. killing a white woman, <laughs> Desdemona. <laughs> I just throw that in, that's a little joke, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it was enlightening, and I went with these young ladies, you know, and they got it going on. You know, they are not scared. They paid the bill. They paid for my dinner. They paid for the opera, you know, it, And but they made me work. They did, I couldn't just sit and be the grand dame. Uh-uh. We went in there, and we mingled, and I got, you know, I got a little mobbed. It was weird. I, I need some pepper spray. <laughs> Come on, you used to it by now. Uh -uh. Cut it out. Uh uh, this is new. This is you know we haven't been out the pandemic, but I don't want to talk about the pandemic. I'm so over the pandemic, aren't you? It's like, please. Ugh. you know, I'm 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 here in New York. The pandemic, it hit y'all first. It, it hit us like no other place. No other place. On a, oh my goodness. So yes, I am over the pandemic. And God and 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 I. Still pray for those who have lost people, those who still are affected by that that COVID nineteen. My God, mm -hmm. um, you you know switching topics. You you spoke about young people, and I just want to segue into. You had the opportunity to work with two young ladies, Tia and Tamara. Mara, oh, my babies, I love them to death. See, I'm close how, to how, them and Regina, it's not, and that. I didn't force that. That's the way it is. But, oh, God, I love them. They got great families, you know. And they're going through their life. Look at it. That's why I say sacrifice. That's what I mean by sacrifice. And it happens to everybody. Sometimes your job is more important than your personal life. 
and only because you love it so much. But when you get home, you got to put the time in there too, you know? So mm-hmm. I, I applaud it. And uh, they, uh, I just like seeing them when they develop on their own, they become so strong and, and they turn around and they can help you, you know, and enlighten you about what's going on and still have a need. You know, can you help me with this? I, I love it. I didn't used to be that way in terms of uh, empathy. I'm just learning empathy. That's my quest. What do you mean you didn't used to have empathy? Well, I can see somebody struggling and go through something and go, no, that's them. They're like people do. But I can see the the pain now that people go through and why it's, you can see why somebody somebody would make bad choices. And the, the pandemic, like I said, I don't want to talk about it, but you can see the loneliness in people. Even when they were married, living with someone, you can see that that pressure of having to be together and then coming back out, everybody ain't coming back. You know, they're not crazy, but they've been isolated in a way and you get socialization skills are acquired and they're acquired through people. And mm-hmm. working remotely might sound very good, but sometimes you need to get out and get in the mix, you know, and the balance is not right uh, coming back out. You look like you're doing okay and I'm doing okay in terms of getting back out in the mix. I mean, I'm only talking to you because you, you was nice about it, but um, <laughs> no, really, it makes a difference in your people skills and world skills. But I have empathy. I can see the struggle. I didn't used yeah. to. Yeah, I didn't take the time because I didn't feel it. But now I can see why some people are going through, you know, some tough times up here. They mm-hmm, may have mm-hmm. the money. You look at them, oh, they're married, they're happy. You don't know their life. You know, you don't see it coming. You, who who knows? So now I, I I don't judge and I don't throw no stones. You know, and you see people drinking and doing drugs or whatever. I don't throw stones at that because for the grace of God, you know, but you try there to help you go. and understand homelessness. I don't even get into it, but we used to call them bums in New York. Remember? That was a bum. Remember years ago? Yeah. That was a bum. That Absolutely. Was a bum. Absolutely. No, no, not now. There are real struggles. You can't dismiss it. It's here to stay. And the Bible says the poor will always be with us, and they will. So empathy. You know, I don't just look and go, what is that? Uh-uh. Try to see if you can help somewhere along the way at, you know, not just by giving money, but understanding. So that's my challenge. You know, I, I, I think you just said a mouthful. And I think the world that we live in um, with so much going on, you you almost don't have a chance to process anymore because what, the minute one world event takes place, it's something two days later. That's going on. And I think we all can learn from what you just said, just to have a little more empathy, because you don't know what people are going through in this world. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You you uh, truly don't. And know that it really, this too shall pass with all we got going on. You can, uh, human beings survive. We're very resilient and creative. We are. Uh We are. We've come through some terrible stuff. I was in New York for 9-11. I'll never forget that day. So, New York is a tough. L.A. is different from New York, and I always do think about, could I live in New York now? I can't because I'm too soft now. I'm soft. <laughs> I don't know what I'd get into there. I know I'd, I'd probably be, uh, oh, I'd be run over because I, I ain't fast enough for New York now, you know, but I love it when I come. But I can see the differences in our people's, you know, livelihoods. Mm-hmm. And it's fun mm-hmm. to see people growing. And we're go- we're gonna we'll get back. We're not gonna get to where we were before the pandemic. Not for me. Not in ten years, but a good two more years, then maybe we'll be we'll be better. But right now, people are still like that. You know? Mm-hmm. I've seen mm-hmm. it. You know, and they live together or whatever. And it's like oh, friendships get broken up. It's, but there's light on the other side. I can see it. And um this is why you're here and I'm here to provide for lack of a better word, entertainment. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you know. Um, I want to, I want to talk because you, you mentioned how you used to look at sitcoms, but you turned out to to, to nineteen ninety four. 
the premier sister sister you turn out the, you you right back on another even bigger sitcom yes and it is it's did, most did popular. you take it because of they, they it's raining money right now or by the time you left 227 you were this ain't bad i i i can do another sitcom no and not because lightning doesn't strike twice in those days i mean you got one. Some people go from show to show to show, but to have that kind of level of success, oh no, I don't know. I didn't work. I don't see. I can't even remember. I didn't work for a while, but I was. I was doing theater and I was doing plays. So I, I know how to hustle. I'm a hustler from New York. Yeah, I, I wasn't scared. But you think, oh, I'll never have another job, and that's how actors are anyway. It's like I'll never work again. But I don't have that fear now at all you know because you know your brand once you know your brand like i could tell i don't know you very well but i can tell you know your brand you mm -hmm. know you like stephen a smith or whatever it's like i know this is what i do you know so now you probably get another challenge and and do something else in addition so that that's the word competitive meaning i can do this and i can do this like who's my hero if you ask me who my hero is childish gambino donald glover He's a renaissance man. Really? See, see, that's what I'm talking. You are so tapped in. My God. But look at him. He's a renaissance man. He does it all he really and is. well. Wait, for years. But he does it well. They should do a documentary on him. I mean, where does that come from? That's what I said. He's competitive with himself. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he could, he does it. He's brilliant. So that's my my hero. I'm, you know, I'm just putting a label on the when I say when I say that. So that's what I, if I could do more, I would, but I, I can't concentrate on everything. I have to have one thing ahead of me. I don't like multiple things going on. It makes me a little schizophrenic. And maybe I am, okay. you know. <laughs> so, so what was your motivation for taking that um, sitcom? Um, I got it. They offered it to me. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be a mom. I was still sexy. I was like, you. once you become a mom, you don't get no sex. I was like, oh, oh, I was again it. Say not against it, again it. I was like, oh, oh mm, what about money? Then I met the girls and I loved them. Oh, instantly. I had met them earlier before we got this show when they were 13 through another friend of mine. So I knew them, but I didn't know them. And they were wonderful and cool. And they stayed, they were authentic. They stayed themselves. They didn't become Strong family, mother and father, brothers, oh, tight with all of them, the whole family. Or well, maybe not the mother, because she a sergeant. She was a Marine. I don't play with mm. her. She don't play. But um, the, it, it, it just enveloped me. And Tim Reed, we're like this. Now, see, I forgot about him. Me and him and his wife, we're like that. We're tight. Yeah, I was going to ask you about him. Very, um, very close. Yeah. yeah. I just saw her. She came to see me because I had a little uh, knee surgery. I was like, Lord, it happened to me. She's like, uh-uh, come here. We're going to do this. I mean, it's, it's so nice to have people who, right there. Every time you need them, you call them, they come, you know. You also had little Marcus Houston on there when, when he was a little guy. No, I haven't seen him anywhere. Really? Anywhere. I don't know. You know, he's living his life. He got married, got a baby. Yep. But I haven't seen him. But I sure, I'm sure when I see him, it'll be cool. He's another one. He's always the same, you know. Yeah, you have worked around so many young people who have gone on to do amazing things in their career. Yeah. You really, really have. And it's, it's interesting because, like I said, 227 was huge for you. But sister to sister, it, it turned bigger. out yeah. <laughs> to be even even bigger. I mean, you, you, you guys did something like 116 episodes? Six years. So I don't know how many that is, but who knew? I didn't even, that's what I'm telling you. I don't look at myself. Even now, I don't look at my accolades and go, mm. Uh, but I'm proud. And I, But I like to see new things. You know, I like this young lady. What's her name? Quinta Brunson. She does the Abbott Elementary. I had no idea she was a writer before this for Saturday Night Live. She can, she's can. she been writing for years. People know her. I didn't. Oh, of her, you know, like Shonda Rhimes, you know, and I'm just singling out women now. I'm a feminist, by the way. Hate to use the label, but that's what I am. <laughs> uh, before they even use the word. Uh, because it takes courage to be successful uh, when you're a woman. Because you got to do it all. I'm sorry. The weight is there. The baby, the husband, and the career. If you got it, do it. And don't be crying. I don't have any empathy about that. Do it or don't. 
But if you choose mm. to just stay at home, that's cool too. But later on, you'll find if you learn a little bit more, you can be more productive because somebody could die, get sick, whatever. You still got to keep keep it moving. It, it matters up here and in here. The heart mm-hmm. is important. I would nurture the heart more if I were younger again. I would nurture my heart a little bit more. How, how, how do you feel being an African-American female actress agent in Hollywood? It, it, you mentioned knowing your brand. Do you feel, you know what? It ain't that bad. I know who I am. They know who I am. The jobs keep coming. I'm going or... I'm to I'm quote share to you. Aging, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's as simple as that. Oh, but I didn't know I'd be working. I thought I'd be down in my condo by the beach in San Diego and painting my landscapes. I'm serious. That's my plan to just chill. I love being around an uh, art community. I mean, that's my my thing. You know, music, I like music. Things they got in New York, you know, but, you know, New York's a little too fast for me now. Like I said, I'm too soft. I want sunshine. I don't want to be cold ever again. <laughs> but that's why I picture myself working maybe a little here and there, but there's certain people working now, and you can count them. It's not many of us, but baby boomers are working, you know, far beyond what I thought. Kathy Bates has got a new show, you know, so it's a comfort in it, I think, for what well, you say aging. I say, oh, it's a comfort in in that, too. You know, a certain, mm-hmm. um, you know, a little smugness. <laughs> they I mean, say it's, it. it's a blessing. You're an actor. It's a blessing to be working, period. Mm-hmm. You know, so, but but. To be aging and still the roles are coming. Ooh, every time you say aging, my my knee hurt. Oh, Lord. (laughs) You have to feel extremely blessed. And and I think it's such a beautiful thing that the parts are still there and people know and respect your body of work and and you're still able to do exactly what it is that you love to do. That's true. That's true. And it's happening in a lot of different professions as well because I was— yeah. Watching, uh, you know, I'm into basketball too. Don't don't get me started, please. But I was watching Charles Barkley, who I know, and look at him. I mean, he's not older, but he's he's wiser, and um, it's needed. It's like a zone that's needed, and it's for younger people. And by for younger people, I mean not just people who watch basketball, but it's wisdom. But it's also having some common sense, which is very rare. Like my mother used to say, "You just don't think." Remember that? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> they want you to just sit a minute and think. So uh, I like seeing people like that. I enjoy seeing people that think like I do. Sounds so simple, but when you're around people that think like you do, it's so comfortable. Water seeks mm-hmm. its own level. I always say that. You always look for people around you and things that, you know, they're up on you. Because if people don't get you, it ain't going to happen. You got to leave the room. You got to let so yourself. Speak, speaking of people who get you, you said you've been married and divorced three different times. Are you dating now? Ooh, it ain't no fun. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Jesus. Oh, oh horrible. The horror. <laughs> horrible. Oh, Why is it horrible? Awful. Oh. Ooh. Oh, gosh. Ooh. Well, first of all, did you see, uh, what's her name? Ebony K. Williams. She was on... Um, What's that with yep. breakfast? Uh, uh, Yolanda Van Zandt? On the breakfast yeah, club yeah. with Ed, DJ Envy and uh, Oh, yeah. Oh. See, th- this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> what? I, I would not expect that you would know, number one, <laughs> you know, the breakfast club, DJ Envy. Oh, yeah. I, He's scandalous. You keep, oh, my God. But him. go ahead. Yes, I saw that interview. But she was talking about how women will not date bus drivers. Yep. Well, let me tell you, I went out with a bus driver years ago. It, was, um, it, it wasn't it was a big thing. I didn't know him. A friend of mine introduced me to him, and he said he drove a bus in North Hollywood. So we went out, and he told me about his route that he takes, what happened on the bus to him. I mean, he, got, he had some great stories. He was sort of like a research project. And he was cool until we got to dinner. He ain't had no money. Oh, they ain't got no money. That's what she's saying. And if you making money... You can't be with somebody who ain't got no money unless they, you know, unless they interest you that way. <laughs> I'm one of the few women on the planet. I'll, if they're younger, whatever you want to do, do it. But 
It's got to be within reason for women. I'm sorry. It's just that way. I'm not going to get no 20, 30 year old man. Mm -mm. But he, the bus driver had no money. So when I wanted to elevate and go someplace different, he couldn't hang. He felt embarrassed. And he talked about it, quite frankly. He could not roll. <laughs> what you mean he talked about it? He, he just, like, I just don't have I it? had to rent a car to act like I didn't have no, you know. You can't drive a Bentley and he on the bus. <laughs> That was a joke, but for real. I know what she was saying, but she's just using the word because he was a nice man. And a catch for some woman, you know, he had a nice apartment. But nice for me, no, not enough, no. No, okay. that's what she's saying, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I went out with a bus driver. I forgot. It was around before Sister Sister. You know, so it was a one-time thing. But I went out. I still know him. He's funny and witty, but it's that economic thing is what she's saying. It does get in the way. And it's not just Got for African-American women. It's all women who are making their own paper, as they say. You making your own coin? I'm sorry. Because men have been doing it for years. Y'all take out women, pay the check, open the door. And it's not natural. But when a woman does it, it's like when the check comes. But I know when I go out that I'm picking up the check. It depends. I don't have any problem with that. That's the very side of me that is very aggressive or competitive. Yeah, I don't have no problem mm -hmm. with that. But... Then I'm like, well, you got to do what I say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Enough. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I heard you say before that you wouldn't mind or you don't got a problem with dating younger men. I prefer it. What you mean you prefer it? It's I not like just that men. you. It's not, it's not just that you would date them. You actually prefer it. Yeah. They think. Why? Yeah, well, they think further ahead, more, more, uh, what's the word, flexible, you know, just uh -huh. different. My mind works differently, that's all. Physically, I prefer younger men. <laughs> when I say younger, younger than me, I don't mean, like I said, 30, I, uh, but uh, I'm 50, yeah. It's just the same level of thinking, you know, and the way I want to go as the day goes on. Because you can't take somebody every day doing the same thing and you're, you're on a different level. It just doesn't work. But if you find somebody you're cool with, I think that's all right. You know, Got you. Can... you are, are you dating at the moment? Didn't you ask me that like a third? Oh, it's horrible. Oh, I told you. It's I, listen, I, you I'm said trying. dating yeah. is horrible. I'm it, saying, dating, are you? I want to. So, so you're not in a relationship with nobody. Right. <laughs> it's different because I'm just getting out like everybody else. You know, you be checking them out like. <laughs> All right. Are you dating? No, I'm married. See? You don't even know what I'm talking so, about. I mean, you ain't got to get out there. It's awful. Uh, you know, I hear men talk about it's awful. Women are saying it's awful. Come on horrible. now. It's Oh. Ooh. <laughs> You All go, right. You well, go let's in the talk, bathroom at the restaurant. Let's you talk look about for a, more a window pleasant. to get out of. Child's like, can I get out of here? Oh, off. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about a more pleasant topic. What What made you go back to doing soap opera? And and you mentioned earlier, you touched on it that you and Miss Marla get the legendary Miss Marla Gibbs are working together again. What made you decide to go back? They asked me, and they wrote the part for me, and they still are, which. Sounds very simple, but very few actors get things written for them or formulated for them, especially um, African-American people of color. What do they call it? BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous people of color. Did you know that? BIPOC? No, I didn't. Me I'm not, either. I'm not I as learned intelligent that. as you. So, uh, and the pandemic was going on, and that's when I started, during the pandemic, because it was a safe gig, too. A structure, uh, you know, where you could go in, do your thing, and not you can have it in a box. So you, you know, infection and all that stuff. That was gonna, remember we were all paranoid about uh, stuff floating in the air. So it, it was a safe haven. It, it, it was um, the routine was easier. It's not easy. Forty, fifty pages a day. Whoo, not easy in terms of the acting or you know learning it. But mm -hmm. it's this. It's like a safe haven. And uh, I like the head writer, um, Ron. He was, uh, he's 
very clever, you know, very, very clever writer. And, and it makes a makes a difference. At, at this point in your career, do you prefer the soap operas? Do you prefer the movies? Do you prefer the sitcoms? I would prefer, I would prefer to do films if I could. That was always my choice. But now mm-hmm. I'm kind of, and I'm not mellow, but, I'm, you know, where I'm at is cool. But I do movies. I still do films. I just did a film with Michael Collier. See, now I just did his podcast and he was there. Anyway, <coughs> and this is only my second podcast. I don't do podcasts. I really Why not? Don't, I don't like doing them because it's like now I don't like to talk too much. I'm kind of running out now. Yeah, I can't. I ain't got nothing to talk about. I ain't, I ain't got that much to talk about. Before I let you up out of here, you 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 have always uh, come across as a very attractive, outgoing, uh, forward-thinking woman in Hollywood. We we all know that this Me Too movement has has gone crazy over the last few years, to say the least. Have you ever found yourself caught up in any situations that were uncomfortable? Absolutely. Or really? All my career. It's a part of Hollywood. That's why I said it's any young lady or any person going getting into show business should know that going in. If you have a certain look, I mean, it comes with that territory. If you're going for that, like I see these young ladies on online and on the internet, uh, social media influences, and they got their bodies out and everything. Back that up. Be able to back that up. Meaning, if you're projecting this and then somebody comes on to you, that's what you were conveying. I'm not saying they should have a right to touch you, but if you're going to be in that world, then, you know, be like, what's her name? Kim Kardashian. If you're going to do it, put it out there. But back it up. But um, um, uh, you're going to be... What's the word? Disrespected uh, coming up when I was younger. But I'm from New York. And I'm like, hey, what you doing? You know, sometimes you get in a situation where you can't handle it. But you got to know what I say. You got to know what's on the other side of the door before you go in. And if you're going on an audition, I went on a midnight audition. I got the job. And then nothing went down. Could have. But it happens. It really does. Okay, when you say you went on a midnight audition. At a hotel. Really? But that's all the time the producer had. But I trusted my agent know about it, my manager. I mean, but things can happen. They weren't there. Uh-huh. They couldn't go in with me. But I, I got the job. I liked the man. Harvey Weinstein Harvey hired me for a great job. He never, you know, it's so maybe. He never he tried like, nothing with you? No. But you know it's there. You can see certain things. But. Oh, definitely. I've had horrible experiences. I only want to go. Like I said, I need to save them for the book. But the other night I went to a comedy club and the comedian was on stage doing these jokes about women, about their periods and um, menopause and uh, what's that postpartum. And oh, he was making me so mad. And not for the fact he didn't know what he was talking about. He was like 20 something, maybe 25. And he's doing all these gross jokes. And I told him I was in the audience. You know, when in the audience, I was a heckler. I was like, boo, right? <laughs> and I said, you you know, I told him, get off. He said, well, you know how they try to get funny. Call me a BBAW or something, which is a bad-ass black woman or something, I found out. And I was like, get off. I mean, but loud. I couldn't take it no more. And then he said, well, why? What's so offensive? Because I said, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, and if you're going to be offensive, at least be funny. <laughs> right? So, you got it? I got you know, it. I got it. I'm uh, sorry. You, you, if you're going to try to be Dave Chappelle, if you're going to be controversial, whatever, at least be funny. You know, know what you're talking about. He know what he's talking about. So, yes, the Me Too movement is here to stay because I haven't done that in years. It tells somebody, get off the stage, room, club full of people. <laughs> I wasn't drunk. He was making me, and he left. He got off. So I had that power. They knew who I was, though. Let me not let me not lie. No, they knew. No, I'm I'm crystal clear that they knew who you were. I, they didn't until I spoke. When my voice came up, they were like, "Oh." <laughs> so I wasn't thinking, but I was with a, a fool. So my friend, he was, he was like, "Oh, he started it." Once you start heckling, you get you in it. It's like going up against Martin Lawrence. I would never. The late Robin Harris. You can't win. They got the mic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't know what mm-hmm. I was doing, but. 
it was based on the Me Too movement in my head because he was saying things that were abrasive to me. But if he was clever, I wouldn't have said anything. Because, you know, Eddie Murphy has had jokes in the past and Richard Pryor that were offensive, but they were funny. So this movement is has taken its own shape and you got to respect it. It may not be fair all the time because there's some good guys out here. There are a lot of good guys. I, most of my experience in show business has been wonderful, but I've had some moments where I wanted to knock somebody out. <laughs> Anybody know, ever cross the line I with you? Them, oh, yeah, but I cuss them out right away. Ooh, I had a love scene. The man got in the bed with, I don't know what he had on. I don't know if it was a thong or it was, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what it was. I was so upset. Cam's ready. Action. I whipped up that because the scene was to get up and get in the bed. And I went, what the hell is that? <laughs> Cut. Oh, I was infuriated, but there was no Me Too movement because I sure would have been the HR. Oh, I sure would have been on that phone. But those were the days when we didn't have recourse. Now you got a whole protocol for, uh, you know, human resources in case people don't know. Well, but hold on, because I'm, I'm not an actor. If you, if you, you got human resources, I hope somebody's there. Ain't nobody no, I'm there? saying if, where you at? What if you if you getting in the bed with somebody while you're doing a scene? What are they supposed to wear? Some drawers, some, some briefs, that... some jockeys. He was ready for. He was. Ugh. <laughs> oh, I will let that part out. He was old. Now, if he'd been young. <laughs> <laughs> Shy, he was oh, old. I want to tell you, this has been my pleasure. You, th this interview, it has been exactly what I thought it was going to be and everything I didn't expect it to be. So with that said, I, 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 I thank you, not just for sitting down with me, but for all the joy that you have brought into the lives of so many people like myself who have watched you over the years. And I know you might not look at sitcoms as much, but so many of us watch them and you brought joy into our households, into our living rooms, into our bedrooms, year over year, week over week. And I thank you for it. And I have been a fan of yours and I'm a bigger fan today. So on behalf of Vlad TV, Miss Jack A. Harry, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence, girl. Thank you.